right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight, you're going to learn about a clever prince who tricked an entire village into watering his rice fields. You're going to learn about dolls that run on mercury. And hopefully, you'll leave with a better understanding about why robotics in Japan is much more integrated in the society than anywhere else in the world. So everything starts with a contraption from China. So the year is 2600 BC. And at least as one story goes, there's a monk. His name is Chi Yu. And he'd like to cross the Gobi Desert. Now, this is 2600 BC. So to give you some context, Stonehenge was being put up. The pyramids were being finished. There wasn't a whole lot in the way of signage in the middle of the Gobi Desert. So, you know, like a proper engineer, he has a solution to this. He's not going to ask the locals or, you know, try to take it one day at a time. No, 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 no. He's going to build a machine. And this machine is going to involve inventing the differential gear and inventing the odometer so that he can always know which direction he's going. So you can program it such that the direction that the figurine originally points will always be the direction it points. Now, later on in history, the story got a little muddled. So there's another very popular take that says the emperor at the time, the Yellow Emperor, was fighting this monk that happened to be named Chi Yu. Complete coincidence, I'm certain. And he'd put up this fog, and he couldn't get through it. So I don't know whose story you want to believe, but there are two versions. What's not disputed is that while the technology was lost for thousands of years, it was rediscovered around the first century by um, Zhang Heng, uh, who was a Chinese polymath. He was responsible for figuring out pi to four digits. He figured out the diameter of the Earth. He built clocks. Science! He built clocks, like everybody built clocks. He built looms, like everybody built looms. We'll come back to this theme repeatedly throughout this talk. And he discovered, or at least rebuilt, uh, the differential gear structure that makes this work. So for those of you who are wondering what the hell a differential gear is, basically it means that you can have wheels that turn independently. So like when you have a car, you have your differential in your car, and that lets your two wheels turn at separate rates, which is really, really important if you actually want to make it turn. So the South Brighton Chariot kind of turns this onto its head, where the fixed point is actually the figurine instead of the drive shaft. So that's roughly how a differential works. And if this video plays, you'll get to see this going. Maybe? Yep. Okay, good. I don't see it on here. Um, so news made it across the pond in Japan around 700. Now, for those of you who are really, really up on your Chinese history, you'll know that this was over 500 years after the compass. So, yeah, okay, you could have maybe done this a little easier but it would have been so much less cool. And they respected that, and I respect that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, fun fact, Dean Kamen, the inventor of something called a Segway, hates this thing, like passionately. You can find screeds on the internet about how much he hates this thing, which I think is pretty special. He hates it because it's too complicated. So, <laughs> yeah, so some of you, you got this, right? Especially coming from a guy who thinks that the best way to do personal transport involves servo motor servo motors, uh, gyros and several top-of-the-line microprocessors. But, you know, who's judging? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll drink to that. <laughs> so that brings us to the beginning of the Japanese animatronic movement. So there is a prince in legend, Prince Kaya. He was a 10th son of uh, Emperor Konmu um, around the 7th to 8th century. Now, this is not a picture of Prince Kai. This is actually his father, Emperor Kanmu, because extra sons are apparently not very prominent on Wikipedia. <laughs> As an extra son, he was shuttled off to a church. Or in this case, right, he had a temple. And this temple had rice fields. And rice fields need a lot of water. So nobody really wanted to water this guy's rice fields. He wasn't much of a farmer. I know, all right, sad, sad rice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't much of a farmer, but he was quite a good inventor. And so he decided that he was going to solve this problem by building a doll. And what this doll did was it held two jugs of water, one in each hand. 
And as you poured water on this doll, it would cry into its water jugs. And when the water jug would fill, the rice fields get, would get watered. And this worked. The villagers were like, this is great. Let's make this little wooden doll cry. It's like this little wooden boy. And they all really wanted to see it cry. Now, I'm just, you know, I can't imagine how he thought that would work. Like, who would really just want to see a wooden puppet cry? And then I thought about it a bit, and it made total sense. <laughs> So this began the tradition of Japanese karakuri. Karakuri, I did say it right. I'm going to say it wrong several times. It's going to be a drinking game. Um, <laughs> so this originally started with temples and with plays. So especially um, in the theater, women weren't allowed in the theaters. So often people built humanoid puppets, later humanoid robots, to show stage plays. Um, and these had to be wound up, so they tended to run about 10 minutes. Okay, good. Oh, I don't want that to be. Is that on? Okay, the sound that's not supposed to be on, but you get to listen to this interesting sound that I did not filter or cut out. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, so this was one of the early animatronic dolls. Um, this was actually made by, I think, Takeda Oni. Yes. And he started this system of building many, many of these animatronic dolls to do stage plays. Now, fun fact is that for those who are familiar with Japanese no and kabuki theater, you notice that the movements are actually very robotic. And they strongly prioritize gesture and expression over sound. And this is a direct descendant of these animatronic theater that the butai karakuri, I said it right again, um, were the predecessors for. So that brings us to the most famous karakuri, which is jashiki karakuri. And this is where you have your tea-serving doll. There's a specimen here that you'll get to play with during the break. Ooh, yeah. Um, they also would ride horses. They'd um, do magic tricks. So one of the coolest ones that I saw while I was doing the research for this was a doll that every time it lifted a little plate there was a different object underneath it. So back in the Edo period, when these were you know, gaining popularity, so lots of you know, noblemen would want to have these in their house. They'd want to use them to impress their friends and create a feeling of closeness. Um, people thought this was magic, right? But it really was just clockwork. But it was pretty impressive back in the Edo period. It was around like 1600 to 1800, roughly. And Japan was completely isolated during this time. So their local arts flourished. Many of the mechanisms were really, really simple. So for example, there's this one doll that somersaults downstairs. Think of it as like an 18th century slinky. <laughs> um, it just falls. And then at the end, it kind of does this little interim thing. All this is, there are a couple pellets of mercury in a hollowed out core in the torso of this doll. And it's purely moving with gravity. So all of these dolls have a unifying theme that there's no electricity, no compressed air, no hydraulics. These are all purely mechanical devices. And that's, I think, what makes them so cool, that they managed to do all of this with any of these newfangled, complicated gadgets. The uh, tea-serving doll was a little bit more complicated. Um, you see it's made out of a fairly complex system of gears. You can kind of see it up there also. Um, it actually can turn around. So the way this works, I'll go ahead and start the video, is that it would go forward for some set distance that the host would decide, kind of eyeballing based on how far their guest was. It would serve the person tea. They'd pick up the teacup. The doll would wait. They'd return the teacup, and the doll would return back to the host. Uh, the actual turning mechanism isn't bevel gears, like Western minds would kind of assume they would be but they're actually a cam and spring mechanism, which is super cool to me. Also, the springs are made out of whalebone, and I spent a lot of hours figuring out whalebone and elasticity because I just thought that that was out of this world. <laughs> um, yeah, whalebone, whalebone makes springs. All right. Um, another very, very famous doll is the arrow shooting doll. Let's see if this video actually plays this time. Okay, that's not looking good, so I'll just describe it. 
This one's a little fritzy. Uh, so what the skull does is it pulls arrows out of that quiver and it actually shoots them at a target. It gets that target nine out of ten times intentionally to provide some suspense to the audience. <laughs> you don't want these dolls to be boring. Uh, there are also dolls that did calligraphy. So these two dolls are kind of like the height of the karakuri, Jishiki Karakuri doll creation time. Okay, so that lady is also not going to play. Both of these dolls were invented by this man when he was 20 years old. This is Tanaka Hisahage. When he was in his teens, he invented a fancy loom because everybody in Japan invents a fancy loom. So his loom was so, so advanced that even though it was automated, it produced higher detail than anything they had to buy hand at the time. So instant celebrity, right? And then he made these dolls, and he was a darling of the nobility, and he toured around Japan showing off these dolls. Later on, he grew up. He founded an engineering company. Um, it made everything from clocks, because again, that's the other thing people make, right? Looms and clocks. So he made a fancy clock that people still haven't been able to rebuild. He made weapons. He made plumbing. So he was you know, kind of uh, another Japanese Thomas Edison. Now he started a company called Tanaka Engineering that his son inherited and kind of handled badly. So the province that it was in, uh, Shibaura took it over, so it became Shibura, Shibaura Engineering which merged with Tokyo Denki. And uh, these two things eventually came to be known as Toshiba, which exists to this day. Uh, fun fact, the uh, far founder of Toyota, also a Karakuri master, also started with a loom. It was Toyota Loom Works, right? It's all about the looms, guys. So finally, that brings us to Japan's first robot. Uh, that was Gakuten Suku, and this was really built to be like a human. So learning from the laws of nature is what this literally means. And this was built by Makato Nishimura, who's that dude right there. And so it's a three foot tall robot, a three meter tall robot, pardon me. And it worked, it was actually really worked on compressed air, so that's it wasn't actually a doll. Um, but it had blood running through its veins and it wrote with a fountain pen. So from the get-go, Japanese robotics was always very organically themed. <laughs> Not in the book. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Which finally brings us to the present day. Um, but hey, there are mecha in this talk. Uh, so currently, the Japanese have a very friendly relationship with technology, unlike the rest of the world, starting with robots like Pepper, which is that little white dude there. Um, who, I don't know if you've seen one in person, it's about yay high, it has a little screen, it looks at your face, it tries to judge if you're happy or sad. I first met at a sake tasting, which was all sorts of awkward. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are also giant uh, robot mecha that have been part of Japanese culture for years. This one's actually been built, it was actually built this year. Um, it stands something like 28 feet high and seven tons, and you can actually get in it and move the legs around. Um, he thinks it's going to be an amusement park. However, he built it so big it doesn't fit through the door. <laughs> so, details. <laughs> so, um, I'll end in a quote by the uh, coiner of the term robot, uh, Karel Shapek, in his play R.U.R., where he said that a robot is a machine that makes the functions of a man, which I think is a much truer definition of robot than just a device that can perform an action. And so with that, I'd like to toast to all the Katakuri masters, from Prince Kaya to Hisahage, to all the people that are making true robots.